Hi there, my name is Dan Warren. I'm a staff scientist at the Okinawa Institute of Science Technology's Biodiversity and Biocomplexity Unit. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some work I did with a group of colleagues, including Alex Dornberg, Katarina Zapfa, and Teresa Iglesias, where we study the effects of climate change on an Australian endemic Pokemon. Before I get to that, uh, I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I kind of generally study large scale questions in evolutionary biology and ecology and with a particular focus on developing new quantitative methods for measuring things and testing hypotheses in, in ways that we really couldn't do before. Uh, I'm originally from the USA, uh, but in large part because of sort of the global scope of my work, uh, I've kind of traveled around a lot and actually have lived on uh, four continents in the past 10 years uh, um, before sort of finally settling here at OIST uh, a few months ago. So uh, just to get into the study now, uh, anthropogenic climate change, it's worth saying, is something that we are going to have to deal with for our entire lives. Um, even if we change our behavior today in terms of emissions and things like that, the response of the climate system to changes in emissions is, is slow enough that we will be dealing with the consequences of past emissions uh, for decades and even centuries to come. So if we care about uh, the ecological future of the world we're leaving for our children and our children's children, we need to understand how that climate change that is already sort of in process is going to impact species that we care about. Now, in a sort of more traditional scientific approach, you would take your species into a lab uh, and, and do some sort of experimental or observational treatment in order to determine how they respond to some sort of climatic gradients. Um, that's great when you can do it, but the world is full of species for which that is not tractable, either due to some aspect of their biology or simply funding, or you know, at the end of the day, there's millions of species in the world. It's not possible to do this for all of them. And so we often need to make decisions that involve having some idea about the climatic tolerance of the species that we cannot study experimentally. And that's where methods like these sort of species distribution modeling or environmental niche modeling or ecological niche modeling methods come in. There's various approaches in this sort of literature, but a lot of them boil down to a pretty straightforward idea, which is we have occurrence points for species, and these days those are kind of latitudes and longitudes like you get from a GPS or even from your cell phone. Uh, we have these maps, these global maps of environmental variables that we suspect are, are important to a whole bunch of species, things like temperature and precipitation and seasonality. And if we have those two kinds of data, we can actually use those points to extract the environmental conditions at places where we've seen our species before. So these constitute a set of approximate observations of the kinds of environments our species likes to hang out in. Once we've got that data extracted, we have a bunch of different statistical methods for building a model of the species environmental tolerances that sort of generalizes the patterns that we see in that data. And once we have that niche model, uh, since we know the distribution of the environmental variables that went into that model, we can actually use this model to predict the suitability of habitat in places where we haven't seen our species before. Uh, possibly even places it can't get to. We can say, okay, well, it lives over here, but it could live over here. So that's really interesting and really useful. But when it comes to climate change, the really important bit is this niche estimate we have here can then be used in the context of an estimate of how the climate change is going to affect those environmental variables. So we, we have an estimate of what the species can tolerate, and we have from other sources an estimate of what the future is going to look like, which means we can predict the future suitability of habitat for that species. And this is incredibly useful because we can go from occurrence data, which is you know, something we've got for a whole bunch of species to an estimate of how climate change is going to affect that species without ever leaving the lab. We can do this on a laptop computer. So it's a tremendously powerful approach to the extent that we can trust it. That's an important caveat, though, because we know these methods have a lot of issues with them. Uh, I mean, we sort of do this not because it's the way we ideally would study species environmental tolerances. We do this because it's very tractable when any other methods, many other methods aren't. 
And we sort of do that with the kind of understanding that the data we're using here only sort of partially represents the process we're trying to estimate. And there's a lot of biases and a lot of noise and things like that. So these are very useful estimates to the extent we could trust them, but kind of one of the main themes in this literature is figuring out when we can trust them and how we can make them more trustworthy. And that's really where this study comes in. So we're going to look at the effects of climate change on a Pokemon named Kangaskhan. So Kangaskhan lives only in Australia. I sort of originally had the idea for this, uh, at least this part of this study, when I lived in Australia. That's why I picked this one. Um, and its reproductive biology is quite mysterious. And there's a whole online appendix to our paper where we sort of go into that and how that may affect its response to climate change. Um, but more importantly, little information is available about its climatic tolerances. We know it is what they call weather boosted uh, when it's partly cloudy outside, but that doesn't really tell us that much about how it's going to respond to say increasing temperature and things like that. So we wanted to understand what the future holds for Kangas Khan, but it's really not as simple as modeling the species environmental niche. We actually have to think in the context of what scientists call interacting stressors. This is the idea that for a given species, there may be more than one problem it's dealing with at any given time, right? So climate change may be one of a bunch of different things it's having to deal with, like, like habitat destruction or, you know, accidentally running into traffic and things like that. Pokemon are actually particularly kind of vulnerable in this context, because think about it. If you play this game, you see Pokemon in the middle of some of the biggest cities in the world. There's a, a star you, for instance, playing in traffic. I mean, it's absolutely tragic. And this is not uncommon. You find these things in parks and on university campuses. So they live in a highly disturbed habitat and so will be subject to the influences that human beings sort of exert on their environment. They're also famously used in sport. Uh, I'm not going to debate the ethics of this, but uh, suffice it to say that bringing a bunch of animals in from the wild for use in sport has got to deplete natural populations, right? Particularly when you kind of couple this with their culture of over-exploitation that's kind of so common in this hobby. So people are told not just, uh, you know, you've got to catch the best Pokemon or the biggest Pokemon or the strongest Pokemon. They're told they have to catch them all. And that's a really problematic from a conservation standpoint for obvious reasons, because there's, there's no point at which they become no longer uh, uh, um, viable for exploitation. So in the context of these already known existing conservation issues for Pokemon, we essentially want to know with respect to Kangaskhan in particular, is climate change going to exert uh, uh, an additional source of problems for it uh, uh, as, as Australia warms and gets more seasonal and all that sort of stuff. So again, we can't bring Kangas Khan into the lab for, for reasons that are probably obvious. And so what we're left with are these sort of uh, uh, correlative uh, inferential statistical approaches. So we did what you typically do in one of these studies. We collected a data set of occurrences for Kangas Khan. Um, in this case, we use latitudes and longitudes from websites for the video game Pokemon Go. People have recorded where they've gone to see King's Con before. We built models using six different modeling algorithms that are very common in this literature. And we projected those models to four different combinations of emission scenario and climate model for the years from 2030 to 2100. What we find is quite interesting. It really depends on the method of analysis, whether you say the future is going to be terrible for Kangas Khan or whether it's going to be potentially good for Kangas Khan. So, so these three methods predict that suitability of habitat is going to decline regardless of emission scenario and climate model. Uh, this one says it's going to get better regardless of emission scenario and climate model. And these uh, say it's quite mixed. Actually, it depends on our emission scenario and climate model. That's interesting, but it's even more interesting when you view it in the context of a, 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 a some other literature uh, uh, that's out there. So this is a, a study I did with uh, Teresa Iglesias again, and Nick Matsky um, came out a, a, a little over a year ago, where we simulated a bunch of organisms in Australia. We simulated data, occurrence data for those organisms. And we essentially, we were answering a different question here. We were asking how well our models 
uh, uh, predicted the true niche of our species and how well we could detect which models predicted the true niche of our species. But because we have all those models, we could actually project all those models for all these simulated species uh, uh, into the future and ask what climate change is going to do to all these simulated species. And check this out, we get something very similar. So now I'm superimposing the Kangas Khan results on the results from those simulated species. For the most part, we see Kangas Khan doing what all these simulated species are doing in Australia when we look at the effects of climate change, or at least what the models say the effects of climate change are going to be. Even more interesting is when you look at this study from Beaumont et al. Um, I'm a co-author on this, but I'm very much in the middle. This is Linda's study. Um, we built models for a whole bunch of different Australian mammal species, and we essentially asked which models predict range contractions, which predict range expansions, things like that. And we got patterns that seem very parallel to what we're seeing here for Kangas Khan and what we're seeing for all those simulated species. And this is really cause for concern, but also quite interesting. We find that some methods pretty reliably predict range contractions or declines in habitat suitability, regardless of whether we're talking about real data or Pokemon or simulated data. And similarly, we find other methods that are behaving very similarly across these different data sets. This suggests there may be these sort of consistent biases in these methods that are going to have a pretty strong effect on the, the model predictions, regardless of what data goes into them. In some cases, we find it suggests these data that may actually have very little effect on the prediction, and that's, that's a, a particular concern. So in real studies, we don't really have the, we don't know the truth. So we don't know when our, our, our models are sort of like getting away from the truth. But what we can do is estimate the biases in any given real study. So we actually came up with a, a new method for doing this. So we modified um, this method by Rice and Tosteja from 2007 um, that they were using for a different uh, uh, a reason. And what we did was we essentially, we just, randomize our data points. We essentially generate data that has no signal in it, and then we model that data as if it were real data. And that allows us to see what biases are built into the modeling process. Because if the data isn't pushing things in any given direction, if we get something directional out of it, that has to be something that's built into the methods, right? And so we do this a whole bunch of times, and we look at what sorts of predictions our different modeling approaches make. And we can ask, essentially, are these methods, even if you give them no meaningful data, are these methods making these biased predictions? And the answer is yes. In fact, if you look at what we say for Kangas Khan in the context of, so now these, these are, are now the predictions from these uh, uh, completely random data sets, we find that Kangas Khan, uh, the predictions we make for Kangas Khan are largely explainable by model bias alone. It's almost as if that Pokemon data has no real biological signal in it, which is concerning. But the more important point here is that this tool is usable for real species as well. So people are using these models today to make conservation decisions for things that you care about, including endangered species, vector-borne diseases, invasive species. And these, mo these biases are probably coming out in a whole bunch of those models, but previously we weren't really able to measure them. But we can actually do better than this. We can do better than just saying, oh, these methods are more biased than these methods. We can actually do this in a spatial context. And we can ask where in space is a particular model, this is now a maximum entropy model, where in space is a particular model, a particular model's predictions more driven by bias and where is it more driven by the data? And this allows us to say, well, you know, even if our model is very biased in some areas, maybe those are areas we don't particularly care about. And so this allows us to explore where in space our models, or our conclusions are actually driven by our data. And it will allow us, I think, to make much more informed conservation decisions because of that. And so we can use these methods to ask which methods are most biased, not just algorithms here, but which methods of curating our data, which choices of predictor variables, things like that, generate the most bias. We can also ask where in space are these biases affecting model predictions. And moving forward, we haven't done this yet, we can ask what kinds of choices we might be able to make to reduce the effects of these biases on our predictions.
And finally, we might actually be able to, in some cases, say, you know, if we're left with a choice between collecting more data or improving our models, this might be an extra bit of information that says, hey, in some cases, maybe your models are so biased that you need to fix those before you worry too much about collecting more data. So we feel this could be very informative to real conservation decisions uh, 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 for a bunch of people. So just to reiterate, these studies are of great importance. These methods are used for a lot of things that you care about. Uh, and this new tool, what we think will help us make better decisions using those models and hopefully make better models themselves. Uh, in case, you know, you're questioning why we used Kangas Com for this study, I have one because it's funny and it's April Fool's Day. Uh, but um, more importantly, we kind of hope to engage a broader audience uh, in the kinds of approaches we're using to try and plan for our ecological future, to get people aware of this stuff and thinking about these issues, and ideally get people uh, uh, participating in citizen science projects that are helping to generate the data that we often use to build these models. So thank you very much. Before I go, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, my, my fellow, uh, my collaborators, as well as people who just sort of contributed advice and read earlier versions of this. And thank you all very much.